Oh, the, this hangout is on air live. It just told me that. Okay, so now we're going to go. I'm going to try to invite you again, Vera. And you have several, so I'm going to try to get all three of them. You've got three accounts, apparently. I don't know which one it is, so. Okay, so there's one added. Hold on. Two. Three. Um, this one's caps. Okay, so um, all right. I'll add one foot into the wild. Any burly? One foot. Well, it's, I'm Alaska time, so, yeah. All right, so let's see. Um, hold on, sorry about this. Did it work? So. All right, so um, let's see. I'm gonna try to think who else to add. I'll invite you right now. And I'm gonna see if I can invite some more people. Hey, how are you? Hi, Bob. I got you. Vera's trying to figure it out, so. Well, that might take a while. Well, that's not very nice. Well, it's Vera. You're live. Remember, you're kind of being rude. Oh. Jeez. It's kind of a harsh crowd already. And he can't hear you, I don't think, because I'm on headphones with you right now until you figure it out. So, and all I can see is about um, his flat top there. Yeah, I'm trying to do some IT work here. Okay, so let's see. Um, I've got to add some more people. Um, I sent you a request, Vera. Bob got his right away, and you got that through Google Hangouts, right? Yes. So are you on Google Hangouts, Vera? You should have a beeping message for you to. Not, not Google Plus, but Google Hangouts. No, not on YouTube. You got to join the conversation on Google Hangouts, and I sent you an invite. Okay. Shh. 
You didn't figure it out? Um, I'm trying. No, no, I'm talking to Vera. What's that? Uh, I sent you three of them. You have three different accounts. Hmm. Okay, well, if you can't figure it out, we can just end the call, I guess. If you figure it out, then then um, call me back, I guess. Okay. So did you and me now? Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out how to add other people and at the same time trying to delete the two false invites or the events, and I can't figure out how to edit them. Oh. So it's not very productive when I can't figure out how to add anybody. Right. So if so, you want to help so, any of uh, those cards. So um, I see the one that's active. Delete, delete the two top ones and save the bottom one. Hmm. So I'm going to leave the leave the live one alone, right? Yeah, that's what we're on right now. Okay. Okay. I think that's working. Um, so I think that corrected it. Okay. Um, now I got to figure out how to invite people. I'll see. Okay. So I go to events. Yep. It shows the one live now. Google Hangouts on air, four people watching. So we've got some people watching. All right, so we're just about ready to go. Um, um, are you trying to oh, invite them to the Hangouts or the YouTube? On the Hangouts through YouTube. Okay, so I'm here. Hello? Okay, you can figure it out. You figured it out. Hey, that's good. So one one of them is Vera. Okay. So it's you, it's Bob and Vera, and then um, I got to get back to that spot, and then we can get started. But I... Yeah, Bob's top of his head. Oh, you don't have to. You don't have to let us go if you're. On, oh, yeah. If you're on, cool. I'll I'll see if I figure it out here. Okay, bye. Okay, so, um, I I'm trying to do too many things at once. It's a little bit hectic. Live now, but I can't figure out how to get back there now that I did all that other stuff. Resume. Hang on, sunny here. That's probably what I gotta do. You're about to join Hangouts on Air. Okay, got it. Hey, I'm getting somewhere. Hey, look at that. You're already there, it says. Sweet. Take me there, it says. Oh, there we go. Send an invite to. Um, I guess I already did a few people, so. And I'm getting a click of something. Which is probably telling me my something's full. Um, I'll just say public real quick. And then I think I'm ready. So Vera thought she was on, but I think she's just viewing it. So 
I don't think she knew how to make it interactive. Okay. Because I just see your photo. Let me close this out. So it looks like we're the only two that figured out how to use it. <laughs> but we made it that far. It says there's five viewers. I can see that. So I'm making forward progress. So everybody who's watching, sorry about the delay. And actually, we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, I don't know how to add somebody when it says to list all available mans. Robert, join the group chat. I don't see any other request for anybody joining the group chat. Um, so I think all the rest of you are probably just watching on YouTube. I was really hoping to get some interactive participation today. And maybe this is uh, new for you like it is myself. So bear with us all, I guess. Um, I know there's a lot of bushcrafter, bushcrafters, survivalists, homesteaders, off the gridders currently using this format. And it's new for a lot of other people. So it's definitely new for me. Um, so basically, if you're just joining us and this is your first time experiencing any of this, it's kind of a combined format through YouTube, through Google Plus, and through Google Hangouts. And basically, oh, how that works, Bob's having a crash over there, is that um, I invite people through the format of my YouTube channel. I made just a short little trailer for that. And then I also invite people and share that on my Google Plus account. So how you actually join me interactive with somebody else. Somebody else is joining. It's kind of a combined format. I can hear an echo though, which is kind of weird. But that's cool. Anyways, um, basically how, how I, you can join up is add us on Google Hangouts and join this live event. So if somebody else did, who just joined in? Uh, Bill. Awesome. Very cool. Well, are you familiar with this format or is this new for you too? It's new for me too. Is this your first time? It is. Okay. Well, you figured it out quicker than I did. Last week I tried this, <laughs> or maybe it was two weeks ago, and it was a total failure because... I couldn't figure out how to get it interactive with other people. You're well, way ahead of me. <laughs> on, uh, on Google, the uh, join uh, button right in the middle of the Google Plus for the show to join, oh, uh, cool. to join the podcast. Oh, that's good. So, um, Bill, where are you from? And, and tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'll, I'll repeat what you said. Okay, well, I'm from uh, North Carolina, but presently living in uh, Manitoba, Canada. Um, oh, really? I, yeah. I didn't realize you were in Manitoba. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yep. well, basically, he was giving a suggestion of on the Google Plus account where I posted about this uh, broadcast, you can hit the join button right there, and that's how you become live and interactive with us if you want to join in today. Otherwise, you can just be a fan. So um, what brought you up to Manitoba? Uh, my wife's from uh, from here and. She, we were. I was living in Texas at the time, and she didn't like the uh, the Texas heat, so she wanted oh, really? to move back home. <laughs> I see. Well, that's cool. So, are you up in northern Manitoba, up in the like the Kettle uh, Pond duck hunting area area? Oh no, I'm down in uh, Winnipeg in southern Manitoba. Oh, Winnipeg is really nice. I mean, the surrounding area around Winnipeg. I went there for oh, yeah. the North American Wildlife Enforcement Officers Conference, and it was, it was really a fun experience. How about you? What do you do there? Uh, presently, I work for uh, Coca-Cola, actually, oh, here. Oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, it was just kind of a last-minute thing. I saw, I saw you there. I saw that you had uh, looked at a few things on Google+, Plus, and I thought, well, I'm going to send him an invite, so I was really glad to join. So maybe it'll well, just be primarily you and I talking today. We'll see if anybody else adds to us. <laughs> has it looks like somebody else might be joining in with the yellow background, so That's whoever me. is... Is that Vera? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's her first time, too. So, yeah, we've got people from uh, Michigan and Alaska and Manitoba, and then I'm up in Alaska as well. So, pretty cool. And I think we're all new to this. Um, basically, my whole objective for doing these live events, I would like to maybe do it possibly once a week or maybe once a week, is just to kind of get a um, exchange of information between our fellow 
like-minded people, people from the same tribe, so to speak, people who are interested in bushcraft survival. And we have all kinds of different formats like you know Facebook, YouTube, uh, but they're not really interactive with one another. And especially um, living up here in Alaska, you would think I'd have a lot of like-minded people, but it's really hard to find people that you know are you know part of our small knit tight knit group. So that's why I found out about this format and wanted to not just have me be talking to people like I already do on YouTube, but share some ideas. So my idea for the show today was just to discuss and um, have some interaction between people about different ideas they might have about um, preserving foods for the winter. And in particular, I like to gather wild foods, but any input you have you know, that's maybe a little bit outside that box would be great. So any kind of uh, food cache ideas or preser preserving food for a you know, natural or man-made disaster or just uh, having a winter store for yourself. So anything that you'd like to add, anyone there? Well, I'm, I'm really new to this, so I'm, I'm here to learn. So. Awesome. Well, you must do some things already. I mean, do you have any, any little tips of maybe something that you grew up with? Um, you know, any do you do any hunting or gathering or berry picking or canning uh, or preserving? Well, I don't do any canning or preserving, but uh, up here we have you know all kinds of berries. Uh, right now, my favorite one is uh, Saskatoon. Oh, really? Yeah. I've always wanted to try Saskatoons. I've never had they are them. They're awesome. And uh, you know what? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. And I just discovered. Uh, I guess they call it an American, the American cranberry or the uh, high bush cranberry. I just found yeah. those up here, uh, pretty close to the house. So awesome. I've been trying those, and but uh, yeah, there's a trail along our just like just a couple of miles from me that uh, is just lined with Saskatoon uh, shrubs. Really? And they're just it's a super it's a super little berry. Awesome. What does it taste like, and what is it what does it look like? Um, it's um, I guess about pea sized. Uh, they're pretty dark. Uh, pretty dark red, um, almost a burgundy color when they when they get ripe, um, and they grow in bunches on a you know on the shrub. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I've, I've never tried Saskatoons. I'm I'm really a wild berry picker at heart. So anytime there's a berry that I'm not familiar with, I like to try to explore that. Um, one of my favorites that you might also have up in your region is the cloudberry. Uh, I actually had cloudberry tea for the first time in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, believe it or not. It was at, oh, wow. it was at the NUIA conference, the North American Wildlife Enforcement Officers Association conference, and I won a um, package there. It was actually from Nunavut, Canada's oh, wow. um, newest territory for you Americans that might not know about Nunavut. And uh, it, I had cloudberry tea, and from that point I was really hooked on cloudberry, and we actually have it up here in Alaska. So. I actually um, harvest cloudberry once in a while. And another idea that I have is it's fun, you know, to pick wild things in our native regions, but we really don't have a very good outlet to share those with other people. So, for example, I have a friend up in the far north in the Arctic, and he's native Alaskan, and I thought it would be fun to make a care package from down in southeast Alaska and send it up and share it. So anybody who might be listening or watching today or even one of us that's interacting would like me to send them some things. I have some things here behind me. Um, I'm really big into preserving a wild medicines and wild teas for winter and just for, for future and also to share with people. This is horsetail tea. Um, mm. It's just the plant of the horsetail kind of um, all put together there and Horsetail is the oldest living plant. It's a 10 million year old plant and it's been here since the dinosaurs and it's full of silica and selenium so it's really good to just take a little bit, steep it in hot water and it's good for hair, skin and nails. And then I'll show you a few other examples of some wild foods I have and maybe it'll inspire some more conversation about some things that you might like to do in your area. Um, so I have some that I've already harvested and dried this is called Hudson Bay tea, and I think you can probably find that in northern Manitoba as well. Yeah. It smells very aromatic, and it's very good for immune system health. And um, this is salmon berry tea. Actually, um, it's got a very good smell to it, and it's uh, a very good anti antioxidant and full of a lot of vitamin C. 
So yeah, basically I just dry these out. Actually, I've done it even in kind of a hillbilly fashion uh, last year on the dash of my truck. I live in a temperate rainforest, and so there's not that much sunlight. And I figured the sun magnifying the things that I gathered on my windshield would help dry it out. So um, yeah, anything else anybody would, uh, else would like to uh, share about things they've dried or preserved or saved up for the winter? What about you, Bob? I don't hear any volume. Is that Excellent. better? There you go. There you go. Any any fish ideas or fish recipes or anything that you like to share? Um, not really. I mean, I I enjoy smoking uh, smoke fish, um, which is a, you know there's various ways that people enjoy smoking fish up here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to make a smoker up, up here in Alaska as well. I grew up doing that. It's fun. Hey, hey Kelly. Yeah. Um, I've been drying uh, sweet potatoes. I have a dryer. Oh so, yeah, food pro or food dehydrator. Cool. Yeah, I, yeah, and I've been doing a lot of, um, you know, I've done a lot of a lot of fruits, but the big thing is, is I've been doing uh, sweet potatoes because that's what I give the dogs treats because the vet said that that is really good. Yeah, I bet that's um, awesome. And so. Are they good for I mean, do you like eating them yourself too, or is it just? Yeah, but I, over, I always over dry them, so they're too tough. So I see. I, <laughs> I see. I'd lose my teeth if I kept eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love but, I love food dehydrators. I don't have one right now. Actually, I picked some uh, Blightus scabrostock mushrooms, and they're kind of finicky to dehydrate. So I didn't have a dehydrator, so I just did it in an oven at a very low temperature. So just left it in there for a while, and that way I'll have these over the, the winter. But yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Vera. That's a really good idea, and um, I think a lot of us probably have dried some foods that way over some period of our, our life. I actually, um, these still smell really yummy. These are all um, round mushrooms, and they thrive um, right after a wildfire. So I actually picked 700 pounds of wild mushrooms after the Sleeper Lake fire in Newberry, Michigan. Shoot, that's probably been eight years ago, and these are still good, and I still have quite a few more. There's not one thing wrong with them, so it's a really good way to uh, preserve them. And I tried um, stringing them with um, just fish line, and I kind of had them hanging all over my house at the time. But I found that sometimes um, there just wasn't enough airflow, and even putting them on my porch, it was just a little bit too much humidity in Michigan. It wasn't really dry enough and sunny enough, and also the, the bugs would get in there too. So I found that uh, using a food dehydrator like Vera just mentioned really worked well. Anything else anybody would like to add about any kind of wild foods they, um, or any kind of foods that they dry and preserve for the winter, or even move, making like a food cache, like a, like whether it's up in the air, like the Alaskan style, or even a root cell or anything? Our ground here is too, uh, is too uh, gummy or gum like gumbo uh, uh, marshy for uh for any kind of a root cellar, I think. Uh, oh, okay. But, uh, in in our, Is it a lot of clay? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a it's a pretty clay, you know, based ground, but uh, it holds a lot of moisture as well. So if you I had a, see. you know, if you didn't have a basement, if you tried to make it just a root cellar, it would probably seep in water and, if not freeze on you in the wintertime up here when it gets uh, minus forty. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely get some cold temperatures up there in, in Winnipeg and other parts yeah. of Manitoba. Oh yeah, it's, it it gets crazy and it's starting to get cold now. <laughs> Is it? What's your temperature today? Um, today, well, it was uh, I think uh, it was around I don't know, like ten uh, ten degrees uh, Celsius. Oh okay. Yeah, okay. So it was, it yeah. was a cool day today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which cool, is, cool here in Alaska too. Yeah. Um, I'm heading to Montana in October to work on my log cabin up in the Rockies, and it's pretty similar, actually, to the temperatures that you would get in Manitoba. It's actually one of the coldest places, or the coldest place on record in um, the lower 48 states. It was 70 below Fahrenheit there one oh. time. Last oh, my Lord. When I was working on it, it was minus 20 Fahrenheit, so it was pretty easy when I would uh, have any kind of meats or uh, anything, I would just put it outside and... But on the other hand, your eggs would freeze inside of the refrigerator. I didn't have the refrigerator on, but just inside the cabin, inside the yep. insulation, 
it would still bags would freeze right in the carton. So you have that kind of thing that can happen when it's really cold, like Manitoba, oh, yeah. Alaska, or Montana as well. Oh yeah. How about anybody else? It looks like there's somebody else that just joined in with us, possibly. No. See a different background anyway. Oh, well, that's, that's just these. Okay. I see. She's figuring it out. Yeah, we're all kind of in a learning curve, but. You know, I really encourage anybody who's listening, it, it will get better, I promise. We're going to get more people on board and more interaction as more people learn how to add, and uh, including myself. I'm not really good at, I'm, I mean, I figured out how to add Bill, and that was a miracle, and I was looking around real quick to try and figure out how to add some more people, but just didn't take the time to do that ahead of time. So we'll get more of a network. Is there anything that any of you folks would like to hear about in the future as far as a survival topic? Well, as you guys are thinking about that, um, you can just interrupt me at any point. I'll just point out a few other things. So I, I can't collect a lot of wild teas, and a lot of um, wild teas you don't eat raw, sort of like you wouldn't eat green tea leaves raw because the plants have too high of an acidity. Uh, but they're really, really good for wild medicine. So if anybody wants any of these that's listening or at any point, just send me an email and I can send you some. This is fireweed tea. And it's also called Russian tea. The Russians have been using it for thousands of years. And it grows wild in northern North America, including places like Manitoba and Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Montana, Idaho, those types of areas, as well as um, up here in Alaska. So it's a, it's a plant that um, over time it gets uh, sweeter as the, the frost hits, so it's a really good time to harvest it right around now. And, uh, it's more sleepy time than chamomile, so that's one of the reasons why that's really well liked. This one I'll share with you real quick, and on, on a lighter note, um, this is called pyrola. This particular variety is called one-sided pyrola, and I think you'll all enjoy kind of uh, the different benefits of this uh, plant. So this one is good for headaches because it reduces swelling and increases blood flow, so therefore it's also good for reducing hematomas, like large bruises. It also... Um, and improve um, circulation for anybody with any kind of circulation issues or maybe any problems um, with their kidneys as well. But it's also nature's little blue pill and it's been used in Asia for thousands of years. So this is pyrola. So you can kind of take that two for one, nature's blue pill, and get rid of your headache too. So um, yeah, I've got all kinds of wild teas. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about on a little different note is um, Sometimes, you know, we get through the growing season and we end up having, whether it's commercial seeds or seeds that you've harvested out of plants yourself left over, and you don't really know what to do with them because, you know, if you just save them in a drawer like a lot of people, their productivity goes down quite a bit over that next season that they're just laying there dormant. But a way to increase their longevity is to actually uh, freeze them. So you can stick them in the freezer and take them out and they're a lot better. Um, in the, the next coming season. Anybody have anything that they um, want to add? Any other kinds of things that they preserve or like to can or anything? Well, you, you know, back on your topic of teas, another plant that I just actually found uh, up here was uh, rosehip. Oh, yeah. Um, and I guess, I don't know if you could eat that or not, but I know they make a tea out of it. Yeah, I've actually got some in the, in the freezer right now. Um, it's really good... Uh, it's up here in Alaska. They grow really big, almost like this. Now, most places they're normally yeah about, about that, that size. size. Yeah. Yeah. So the ones up in Alaska, they're almost like a giant crab apple size. Oh wow! And That's they have huge. the highest vitamin C content of any uh, wild plant in North America. Oh wow! So they're really, really awesome. And so they're great to make a tea with. You can actually, I was just researching. I'm going to make um, some, some jelly out of rose hips. Oh, okay. So there's actually a few different products that you can make out of them, and maybe I should do a video about that, but um, they actually have some natural pectin in them as well, so you don't have to add too much to it. So um, oh, okay. I have some right here if you want to take a look at what they look like. So <laughs> these are giant rose hips that I have in the freezer. Holy so they're, they're those are monstrous <laughs> sizes compared to normal rose hips. So like a lot of things in Alaska, they're pretty big, but... Um, this one uh, just is a good example. So they actually, I don't think I can break it up because it's froze. Maybe I can. Um, they have, I don't think you'll be able to see it. They have little silica-like fibers. And some people say they're irritating to your throat. So I wouldn't advocate actually eating them raw to okay. anyone else. 
but I've been doing it for years and I've never really hit my throat. So it's completely up to you, but if you're in a survival situation, I mean, that being full of vitamin C is um, something that can save your life. Because if you're in a long-term survival setting, you don't add vitamin C to your diet, you die from scurvy. So it's yep. really important. And a lot of old-time explorers and adventurers, that was how they met their demise, if you go back through history. So uh, actually, that's a really cool topic. It's a little bit off the, the winter survival cache topic, but it's, it's a great survival tip. So all pine trees in North America have vitamin C and are edible, except for the long needle pine found in the southeastern United States region. And it has needles on it that are like this long. So I'm wow. talking, well, well, you know, over a foot or so. And they're found in places like Florida, Georgia, Alabama, you know, South Carolina, maybe up to North Carolina, down in Mississippi, Louisiana region. So if you're not in that region of the United States, every other pine is edible, full of vitamin C, and so is hemlock as well. Um, not poison water hemlock, of course, but hemlock the tree. Yeah. Hemlock the tree is often misunderstood, but it's full of vitamin C. You can just pluck it off the tree, or you can make a wild tea out of it, just a sun tea if you don't have any way to heat up the water, or just, um, you know, just make it into a tea over the fire at night to make a nice soothing way to relax. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of wild berries were pretty spoiled rotten up here in Alaska. There's things like Nagoon berries, salmon berries, bunch berries, um, let's see, about five kinds of blueberries, huckleberries, there's even a red huckleberry, which are my favorite. Um, we have uh, bog berries, pumpkin berries, um, boy, there's just so many kinds of berries. And of course, I freeze a lot of those and sometimes dry it. One thing that I've never made that I really wanted to do, though, is a pemmican. Has anyone made pemmican? I've eaten it, but I've never made it. <laughs> oh, really? Did you like it? It was good. It's it, it's a little bit different. It's, it's kind of acquired, but it it was good. It it wasn't like homemade or anything. It was uh, it was manufactured, but it was all right. Oh, okay, awesome. If you're not familiar with what pemmican is, it's usually um, dried, pulverized fruits of some sort, and then usually some bear grease added to it, and often some smoked fish that's pounded and dried as well, and then it's all mixed together. And it was a way for native people and also explorers like voyagers and other explorers um, it, throughout history to actually carry foods with them for long periods of time. And the natural oils from, let's say, the bear fat of the old-fashioned way of making it allowed it to be preserved without refrigeration for sometimes you know, maybe months before it would go rancid. So, yeah, it's a really good way. And it's high protein, too, and you've got your nice fatty acids. And this, what I had, was actually made with bison fat and oh, cool. bear fat. So. Awesome. Yeah, basically you can use wherever you're at, whatever is yeah. locally available for sure. Yeah, that's really neat. I've never tried it yet. It's on my list. I, I love to read about it in the old, you know, travelers and adventure books as well. Yeah, I also, I want to make a food cache up in the air one day, too, kind of like uh, Dick Prenicky from Alone in the Wilderness up here in Alaska. He's really an inspiration. I would love to make one of those Alaskan-style food caches for sure. Um, anybody else have any wild berries or wild plants or wild meats that they've smoked or anything like that? Hey, Bob, have you ever seen any Native Alaskans smoking or drying um, salmon through the sun? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they do it in a lot of the villages uh -huh. where they, you know, they'll basically cut the filet in half and hang them over um, cords or um, some people even use, uh, like, boughs of trees that they lay across from one opposed to another, and they just sit there and uh, dry them out. Yeah, so I've seen where they've sun-dried them, and I've also sun-dried some fish, and then I've also seen where they smoke them usually with alder tree or something like that, so kind of two different ways of doing it, and they have different textures. Of course, the native people up in, you know, not just uh, Alaska, but also in, you know, places like the Yukon and northern British Columbia and Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Nunavut and those types of places, and even over in northern Quebec and on northern Ontario, 
they were uh, very dependent upon all of the fish, so they had to save it for the winter, and they had different ways of eating it. My favorite is uh, like a fish jerky. It's not even really smoked fish. It's just more chewy, and, and it's often sun-dried. I also um, brought back some northern white cedar from Michigan when I was visiting home, and the reason why I brought it is um, this plant is full of vitamin C as well, but in... Um, other places around the world, other cedars are actually can be poisonous. So this is really good to um, reduce uh, inflammation in the intestinal tract when you have any kind of discomfort. It can be used um, for women that might have any kind of cramps, and it's also used sometimes um, right up until pregnancy as well. So this is northern white cedar, but there's also um, other cedars that can be more dangerous. So it, it takes me a little while to prepare these, but you know, these wild herbs can last me sometimes for a couple of years. This is um, a wild goose tongue. It's actually an intertidal plant. And you, I also dry seaweed. I don't know if you've ever had seaweed, like, at a sushi place or maybe from Costco or someplace like that. But you can actually dry your own. And this is one of my favorite smells on the planet. And it's weird because it smells totally different than when the plant does when it's, when it's uh, live and fresh. So this is an intertidal plant. So that means that it grows in the salt water and uh, they're brackish water. So as the tide goes low on the sea here in Alaska, it's up to 25 feet in a 24-hour period. Um, so six, every six hours it changes from low, high, low tide to high tide. During that low tidal period, I'll go out and collect this. And these little spindles are the seed pods, and that's what you make the tea out of for the goose tongue. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, any other tips? You guys are all listening and you have your own experiences in your own lives, wherever you're from. So anything that you'd like to add or any comments you might have on this format and doing it better next time or any thoughts on survival? Hmm. No. Um, yeah, it's, we were talking about fish uh, up here in Canada, well, in, in Manitoba here, um, the favorite fish for like smoking or drying is gold eye and moon oh, eye. Oh, really? Yeah. Those are some pan, they're little pan fish, I guess is what they would be, you know, likened to. Um, okay. And. Are they just dried in the sun? Gold. Yeah. That, yeah, some people do it, you know, the old way, you know, hang it on racks, you know, and just dry it in the sun or then they'll smoke it in their smoker. You know, wow. or in, in their smoker, but uh, yeah, that's the favorite. Seems to be the favorite uh, cash crop fish up here. Oh wow! And how are they caught? Are they caught with a, a cast net or? Um, well, they uh, long line and, and okay. long netting up in the okay. in in the big lakes, uh, Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg here. Okay. Yeah, I've been to uh, Lake Winnipeg and Lake Winnipeg Osis, the yeah. far north side. Of it. Yeah. Um, I did want to share with you this uh, wild plant. It's probably one of the most common, really powerful wild medicines that you can find. And it's a little hard to see. I'm trying to put it at the right angle of the camera so you can get a good, clear picture of it. This is yarrow. And it's found wild all over northern North America. Now, you might not really necessarily recognize it. I'm going to hold it just like this and try to hold it steady so you can kind of be looking at it as I'm talking to you. And I'll give you a couple identifying factors. First of all, actually, see where my fingers are. This um, part of the leaf, it's a little hard to see because it's dried. Trying to put it in a good spot. Um, is one, one way you can identify it. It's got kind of a feathery leaf and you can make a wild tea out of the, the leaves or the, the flowers. These are white flowers usually in the wild, although in a cultivated garden like um, maybe you know, your spouse likes to grow different flowers in the garden. This is a very common plant to be grown, and it'll be found in pinks and purples and different shades like that. But it's one of the most medicinal and easily identifiable uh, wild medicinal plants in northern North America. And it has probably a hundred different uses. So it's good for colds and flus and fevers and sore throats. And actually, uh, my friend has some in the garden, and I'm going to go out and gather it all before... Uh, it all freezes and, and goes away. There's also some chives out there as well. So this time of the year, you know, we're thinking about um, kind of taking things out of our garden, but sometimes we forget about 
what might be wild in our own yard, maybe as a weed. This often grows as a weed on the edges of um, lawns and sidewalks and driveways, and people don't really realize how important it is. So, and it's also, when it's fresh, a very good blood coagulant. So you make a spit poultice out of it and put it on the infected area, so it will, it will help um, kind of pack the wound in its antibacterial. So this is a very, very important plant to identify. And you can look it up um, online if you're not familiar with it and get a good photo of it. It's Y-A-R-R-O-W. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. And once you dry it, you know, you have that available all winter long. And there's so many wild plants that you can gather um, really pretty easily, like right in, right in your own yard possibly or along a sidewalk. Or you don't necessarily have to live in the wilderness to gather wild plants. And if you preserve them for wild teas, um, most of the wild teas are also full of vitamins and many other really important nutrients. So it can be a wild medicine to carry you over through springtime. Yeah, that's uh, it's funny. In my in my yard alone, we have um, pineapple weed, which would which would be a oh yeah almost like a chamomile, where substitute yeah. for chamomile. Um, I have plantain that grows everywhere. Oh. And uh, yeah. common mallow all over my backyard. It's crazy. Oh, really? Yeah. So I see. I don't know that one. So that's that's one that if we really start exchanging any kind of wild plants, that's one I'm not familiar with. So what do you use um, wild mallow for? Um, well, it can be eaten as a, it's a. I guess it'd be eaten as a green. It's a again, it's like most greens, just tons of vitamin C and whatnot in it. But it's it's just a good wild. You know. You'll put it in with your with your wild salad and your dandelion and whatnot. Okay, okay, cool. Well, that's really neat. I'll have to look that up. See, that's the joy of kind of joining in a group conversation like this. Um, I didn't want to just talk to people. I wanted to interact and learn from other people that are, you know, of like mind from different regions of the country and the world and different countries. And that's what this is all about. I. I just find that our bushcrafting community is, you know, so amazing. But it, it's uh, so hard to find people like us in the, just the general population. Yeah, it's true. I'm the only person I know of in my area that uh, is into bushcraft or any of this kind of stuff. So, it's what are some of your um, strongest interests? What do you What are you specialize in as far as bushcrafting? Um, I like uh, shelter, um, natural shelters. Um, um, I'm trying to learn the bow drill. Um, oh yeah, that's fun. Yeah, it's a, it's an art. It's it's really an art. Yeah, that's that's a hard one for me right now. Um, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard for most people. I've yeah. I've been around two people in my life, actually three, that were absolutely phenomenal and just awe inspiring. They could start a fire with a bow drill kit that they gathered from the forest, and one of them's uh, Dave Canterbury. One of them's Boyne. Yeah. Like, and uh, Creek Stewart is very good at that as well. So, and they're just pretty amazing. And then I have another friend that's an expert at the hand drill. And I oh, consider wow. myself a student um, and, you know, and an instructor sometimes. And that's what's really important is that all the skills that we do develop, you know, it's really nice to be able to try to share them in a non-egotistical way with each other so that we can learn from one another and better our skill set. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's actually uh, Dave Canterbury is actually where I ran across your uh, YouTube channel. Um, oh. Okay. <laughs> you know what? I guess probably about a year and a half, almost two years ago. And oh yeah. Been, you know, following Dave Canterbury, and then I found your channel through Dave's channel, and it's just you know been a phenomenal learning tool. Yeah, absolutely. YouTube and, and subscribing to YouTube channels is really, really important for people like ourselves because we are probably less than 1% of the world. In oh, yeah. And it's just so hard. And I've made friends from all over the world. And, I mean, not that I've been there in person, but, you know, we've communicated. And I think in this format, you know, it'd be so fun, like, maybe to share uh, bushcrafting around the world. And I should say, like, specifically, like, bow drill. It'd be fun to get some people, you know, invited on one of these one week, and we could all, you know, maybe have our bow drill kit and just share some experiences and and some things that we've learned and some things that fail and and just kind of, you know, get better with our own knowledge through each other. Oh, absolutely. 
that's one of the things that impressed me so much when I first met Dave Canterbury is when he first started out, he didn't really know a lot. And honestly, I don't know if he would really say that, but maybe he would. But he admitted it when he was first new in his videos, and he was really humble and modest, and he said, come on, let's learn together. And that was kind of his motto. And it really impressed me. And, I mean, now he's one of the most successful, you know, survivalists as far as, um, you know, teaching and making a living at it and supporting his entire family, extended family, with that whole, you know, survival store they have and all of the pathfinders that follow him all over the world. And it's just really amazing. What a, what a good model for everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and we all have something to share. There was actually something I, I shared today on Facebook, and it was um, a big, long article. And it was actually pretty well done. It was probably an investigative reporter that had no idea about anything to do with survival, I would guess. And it was for TV Guide, and it was kind of focused a lot on Cody Lundin. But it talked about numerous um, what we'll call TV survivalists, so obviously... There's people that are survivalists that are not on TV, so I don't mean to you know, minimize any of their skills or anything like that, but it was focused on TV survivalists because, of course, it was for the TV guy. Anyways, my point of this is that it talked about all these different survivalists, pros and cons, and um, it talked a lot about Cody Lundin, and I don't mean to call Cody out necessarily you know, uh, specifically, but he really kind of cut on Dave, and I came out publicly and defended on Dave because... I think there was just a personality clash there. My point for bringing this up isn't to add to the controversy. It's just that we're all different. We're all different skill sets. We're all from different places around the world. We're all coming into survival at different times in our lives. Some of us are maybe in our 60s or 70s before we begin to be interested in survival. Other people are practicing these skills as soon as they can walk. Some people have great mentors their whole life. Other people are adults before they even get out into the woods for the first time. So it's just, I think it's really important in this world to be supportive of one another in the survival world, bushcrafting, um, off-gridder, homesteader, whatever you call yourself, prepper, whatever part you are, not to discredit one another, but to support one another and kind of grow our community and grow our skills together. And that's a, that's a good point. Um, there was a one of the uh, survivalist type uh, YouTube channels was making fun of someone for purchasing uh, a store-bought fatwood the other day and that's kinda the same point I made right there was you know instead of you know putting this person down because maybe he doesn't have pine or fatwood in his area but he's got access to it through through a store you know absolutely and, you know, we all start somewhere, yep. you know, and why, it, it actually gave me chills when you said that, and it probably sounds funny, but I'm just not for picking on people. First of all, I bought store but bought fatwood, so whoever was criticizing that person, yep. you can criticize me too. I can take it. I got yep. big shoulders. <laughs> but um, I've lived in places where I didn't have anything like that available, and even if I did you know, you don't know where somebody's paradigm is, and everybody's just, you know, in this day and age where we've lost so many of the traditional skills that our ancestors once had. People are living in suburbia and spending so much time, and, you know, all kind of teched out and less time in the woods. You know, and now we're trying to get back to our original skills, and we're often having to learn them by the means of YouTube. Maybe we didn't have a mentor. Me, for example, I have a very loving father, but he's not really into the same kinds of things I am. So yeah. I'm about 99% self-taught reading and now more currently on YouTube and in other formats and so I'm just really appreciative of everyone out there who does share their their knowledge and and also who tries to broaden their knowledge and, and especially to get youth involved and get them away from you know techie stuff yep <laughs> I've got a 14 year old son that I'm, I'm really trying to get more into the outdoors than and off those video games yeah Hey Vera, do you have anything to add about your uh, your nephew that's getting more in interested in the outdoors? Maybe she left us. I can hear her oh, in the I'm back. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I heard um, you. Hey Vera, oh, so about the outdoors? Yeah, your your nephew. He had the opportunity to go with me to Dave Canterbury's Pathfinder School, and you you made sure he got there and. And oh, what did you yeah. think about, you know, how that's shaped his young life and, and how he's so interested in the outdoors now? Well, it's just interesting that at the age of, uh, he's now 13, 
and he's so different than his other other kids because he had so many great experiences. The kids around here don't really have great experiences. I mean, they just play sports. They they don't get to learn to think for themselves and think how to you know how to survive in situations. And uh, you know, the curiosity is. I, I feel privileged that he was exposed to that because he has a different mindset. You yeah, know, I remember. I remember him specifically, his name's Joey, and I remember Joey uh, helping me make my first um, ever longbow that Jamie Burley actually was my lead instructor and a wonderful, wonderful teacher. If you ever have a chance to, to make a, a bow, a self bow, um, Jamie Burley is a really good instructor from one, in, one foot into the wild from the Port Huron, Michigan area. So uh, really, really great instructor, and he's also one of Dave Canterbury's Pathfinder instructors. So I was making my, my bow um, for the, my first ever time as I was a new student. And, you know, it was a big project for me. It wasn't uh, kind of just a real rough bow or anything like that. It was something that we had honed for several days. And Jamie was basically teaching me the beginning steps of the art of it, which I don't consider myself a professional, uh, you know, boyer by any means. But it was really, really fascinating. And, and uh, Vera's um, nephew got to experience that and help me with it, and it was just really neat to see him. It was he was only there for one day, and I could just see it his 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 mind open, his eyes open, and he, you know he really became more you know engaged. And now he now he's got his own kayak, and he wants to go fishing all the time, and it's just really neat. So he's really changing as a young man. Yeah, and also when we were uh, you know out in the woods what you call woods in South Haven, Michigan. <laughs> he, he was like looking at all the bugs. He goes, you know, I could eat that one, Aunt Vera. You know? Oh, that is a good point. <laughs> so, so her nephew um, came into this blindsided. He had never been to such an event in his whole life. And if you're not familiar with Dave Canterbury's Pathfinder School, he lets you bring one child for free, which I just think is awesome. And so anyways, um, when he was there, I encouraged him to get involved in some of the youth activities, including the youth competitions. And her nephew won by eating this big, giant, burly, gnarly-looking moth. I'm not kidding you. That moth was like that big. And he ate it. And after he got done eating it, after he got done eating it, Dave Canterbury says, well, I didn't think you were really going to eat it. <laughs> So he actually won for his prize. Yeah, he did throw up on the way home, though. I think this was awesome. <laughs> yeah, He didn't throw up then, but, but on the way home, he was like, I gotta pull over. I need a shake. <laughs> Chocolate shake to wash the bug down. Oh, it was big. It was a big bug. I'm talking the body of the bug was at least as big as my phone. It guess. was crunchy. Oh, man. He was breaking bones in insects. <laughs> he said, This one's smaller, Aunt Mira. <laughs> How about how about you, Bob? What about your uh, your son getting involved in the outdoors, kayaking, and exploring the woods and nature? What do you think that's done for his life? Oh, I think it's awesome. I mean, he, uh, so you know, we went kayaking this, uh, this summer, and then he uh, last week he uh, went uh, and uh, participated in a kayak race. And so he's he just turned ten two weeks ago, and it was a two and a half mile um, mm. race, and he came in first in his age group. So, yeah, I think it's really yes. important to you know engage youth in the outdoors and teach them survival skills and bushcrafting skills. And I really think that you know our life is really short, and one of our biggest goals in life should be a be good stewards to stewards to this earth and to share our knowledge with other people who might be less fortunate. And especially to you, who might not have that knowledge, you know, it's really important to be a mentor and share our knowledge with with others that, you know, maybe haven't had the same mentors and opportunities we have. It's time for us to step up to the plate and teach them what we know. Uh, Kelly, one thing that you know, I, if you remember the conversation we had the other day about how people they just wait for everything to be perfect and they have the right equipment and and they you know spend all this effort getting everything right and you know I have this old F-150 truck you know and you know our kayaks are okay you know but we're just kind of look like a bunch of little you know, hillbillies running around which we love you know and uh, and and they said Joy isn't it interesting a lot of people have the beautiful stuff but it's still sitting in their garage we're out there using it and that's all that matters is we're actually doing something had a nice something nice or something crappy 
we were still experiencing the outdoors and made it happen and not made any excuses for, for it. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, you know, it's, it's so key to what we're, we're really trying to, to say here. You know, whether it's bushcrafting, survival, off-grid, or homesteader, or just going out on an outdoor adventure, um, there's people that want to criticize other people because they don't have as nice a gear or whatever. You know, that's really the total wrong message. You should be really excited and proud of somebody who has something that isn't as good as yours, and they're still out there doing it. You know, give them a lot of credit. You know, and like, like his life jacket, you know, it wasn't a kayak life jacket. You know what I'm saying? But it didn't matter. He, you know, he didn't use it as an excuse. He still said, yeah, well, this will do, you know. Well, five years from now, he's not going to remember what life jacket he yes. wore that day, but he'll remember that you took him to South Haven, Michigan, and he kayaked on Lake Michigan and rough waves, you know, or calm waves or whatever it was. He'll remember that the rest of his life. So you gave him yep. that opportunity and those skills to, to make that all happen. And, you know, that's key. I, I started a youth camp now. It's been about nine years ago. And Vera was um, you know, a volunteer through a lot of that. And, you know, we've been friends for a long time. And, and a lot of people kind of gave me a hard time when I was going to start that program because they said, well, you, you don't have a background in running youth adventure camps. You don't have a counseling degree. You don't have a psychology degree. You don't have, you know, the most wonderful liability insurance. You know, what if, what if somebody accuses you or some other child there of some wrongdoing? You know, how are you going to protect yourself? And you don't have volunteers that are trained in counseling. And the bottom line was... I knew there was a need to help kids, and I wanted to engage them in the outdoors, and I could have waited to try to see if I could make everything perfect, but I didn't. I just made it happen, and the first year was a little rough. I didn't really have a great idea of what I was going to do, uh, but, you know, it came together, and you know, I had um, speakers and presentations and, you know, involvement activities every hour of the day, and, you know, it was like the smartest thing I ever did, because if you wait till everything's perfect, you're never going to do it. And you're going you're to miss out on most of your life because you're just waiting for things to be perfect. And it's really important, you know, just get out. A kid doesn't care if he's wearing a five-year-old life jacket or he's got a kayak that's 15 years old or that he, he's got a, a, a Mora knife, which a Mora nib is one of my favorite knives, by the way, but it's a really inexpensive bushcrafting knife if you're not familiar with that. He doesn't care if it's that or if it's, a, you know, a you know, five hundred dollar, you know, like buck knife or something. He doesn't care. He just wants to. He or she wants to be out there with you. Wants to to have a mentor. And you know, that's what it's really all about. Yep. All right. Well, this is going really, really well. Um, even though we kind of, you know, float into another topic, I I just think that's kind of the key to who I am is inspiring, you know, youth. And pretty much any time I talk, that seems like that's the the area that it always ends up going to. Does anybody have any other comments or things that they'd like to add? No? Well, I think maybe we'll just call this a wrap for now. Um, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity for me, and I'm trying to learn the technology, so please feel free to invite anybody in the British Crafting Circles. I'm not exactly sure if I'm going to be able to do it on the same day every week, but my goal is to try to have one of these events maybe once a week. It, I might skip some if I'm on a long-term adventure, but my work schedule makes it really difficult um, for the next month to be able to pick a particular day, and after that it might be a little easier. But, um, yeah, let's, en let's encourage other people to join up with us, and I'll try to put it out there a little bit more ahead of time what the topic's going to be. And, and get us a, a group of people in here that, you know, want to share. Thank you, Kelly. Thank yeah, you, thank Kelly. You. <laughs> thank you. It was great joining everybody, so thanks for bearing with me through the technological difficulties. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> Signing out of Michigan. It's 10.46 p.m., so I don't All right. Really Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody, from Bye. Winnipeg, Manitoba. <laughs> Good night. Thank Bye, you. Bye-bye.